Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, let me start off by just, I know we have a diverse set of folks in the room, a lot of people who are familiar with TransUnion and on the Financial Services and Credit Risk side, and those who are maybe not so familiar. But I'd like to start out with just a little overview of TransUnion. Many of you may know us as one of the three national consumer reporting agencies. Uh, and true, that is one of our core capabilities. But when we think about TransUnion and the access to data and analytics and the things that we do, uh, we have a vision around this. I think it fits very well in this concept of alternative data. And we really talk about this idea of helping people access opportunities to better quality of life. Uh, and the information that, that we gather, we manage, and we provide to financial institutions and others to help uh, make lending decisions in the area that I'm focused on is particularly important on this. And you know, we call it information for good, and it's really a vision by which we live by and drive the core of the business. And so we use it to talk about alternative data, underbanked and unbanked consumer. It's a, it's a phrase we hear a lot about. It's people who get, who need and want more access to credit. And who are they? Well, to describe who they are and the size of the opportunity, talk about kind of two groups of folks. We say people who are unbanked. We would look at them as really having no information on that consumer within the TransUnion credit base, uh, credit database, or the sources we have access to. Uh, those tend to be students uh, over 18, but maybe new to credit. So if they're adults in the adult population with access, just haven't had it. Recent immigrants, uh, and there are a set of non-active uh, spouses and partners of folks that just have never had need for it. So that's one population we talk about. And there's another population. And it's of particular importance, which is we think of as underbanked. And these are folks that we would have a little bit of information on the TransUnion credit file, uh, but not a lot. And usually a little bit, but not a lot, makes it very hard for us or for lenders to render credit decisions in the best possible way. Uh, or they may not be recently active. They may be people who have, uh, for example, they put expatriate Americans who have had a very full uh, financial life went overseas for three to five years and they come back and it's, it's an aged file that makes it very hard to measure current credit, credit worthiness. New credit folks, I talk about the students, a lot of times you get a, access to a first car or first card. Uh, one source of credit is quite not enough for most people to make decisions. Retirees fit in the same category. Um, what I want to talk a little bit about, how big is this population? And for that we refer to some work the CFPB did a few years ago around what they call credit invisibles. Um, and they, they categorize them a couple of ways, and I turn them back in our definitions of unbanked and underbanked. And when you look at the population of uh, adult consumers in the US, there are about 235 million of them. Almost 20%, according to the CFPB, qualify as unbanked and underbanked. So it is a significant portion of the population. And our ability as an information provider and um, partner with many financial institutions to give these consumers access to more credit is important, not just for them, but for the financial institutions that we work with. Uh, so just a little bit to, to understand who these are. Um, these are consumers who surprise them that they're not necessarily what you would think of as a bunch of low income consumers that are sort of under the radar on purpose and whatnot. There are actually a significant number of unbanked and underbanked consumers who are moderate to middle income, according to the CFPB. And that, again, for lenders, uh, is particularly important because there's a great opportunity to extend good quality credit consumers if we can just understand better how to make, how to make those loans. Uh, so it's a significant population which is of interest. The other thing that's also of interest from a financial perspective is, you know, this is a generally skewed younger population. So if you're a financial institution, you're looking to create lifelong relationships with consumers. Um, younger consumers are great ones to connect with, particularly if you're unbanked and underbanked. All of us probably remember the first credit card, the first auto loan we got, and who that financial institution was. And if it was a good relationship, there is a chance that we still have that card in our wallet today. So again, for lenders, there we are. Discover card, first card you got it. 
it's a good relationship. And so if we, as an industry, can help uh, financial institutions and consumers connect, then we create great opportunity. So that's why, again, this is, this is, if we can help these millions of folks, we believe alternative credit data, uh, some of the ones we'll talk here, some of the information like the bill pay data that Urgent has really creates opportunities for lenders. So we'll talk a little bit about the way we do it. So first of all is, what do we think of when we think of alternative data, alternative credit data? We actually categorize it into to three categories. Um, and we think of it as, if we call it credit data, it has to be compliant with the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, and we typically consider it as not reported to one of the, the national credit reporting agencies. And in the three categories, we think of alternative credit data are actual loans that institutions make, like short-term single pay or uh, payday loans that are legitimate financial instruments, uh, but have typically not been reported to the, to the national credit agencies. And there's another set of areas which we call obligation data. These are utility bills, rent payment, telco. Again, not necessarily reported to us, but it represents an obligation that consumers have over time. There's also information that complies with the FCRA that we consider to be non-obligation data, which are activities that, that you undergo that are publicly available, can be disclosed, disputed, and everything with clients with law, but aren't necessarily credit transactions. A lot of those have to do with public records, um, tax liens, some of the checking account history that's out there. So there's a lot of alternative credit data out there, and there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, but what it does is if you think about the use of credit data, uh, alternative credit data, we believe it gives you a more complete view of underwriting risk of a consumer. And I, I try to contrast the traditional, what we call the point in time view of consumers. If you pull what many of you imagine from your credit report and, and, and make a loan, you typically see a consumer based on what's going on with their current mortgage balance, perhaps uh, an indication of a late payment that's on credit file, you get a view and you can make, in most cases, a decision. Um, but when you have a broader view, both through um, an expanded view of the credit report that we offer, but also alternative data, you see a lot more about this consumer. Not only do they have the mortgage balance and, you know, a late payment that you may be concerned about this, um, but you see, you know, they, they made other payments, but they tend to stay very close to the minimum payment required. They're balancing, they're, they're building balances. Uh, they, may, you know, they may have a payday loan inquiry, uh, and you understand a little bit of the value of the home for which they have the mortgage on. This may make you view the consumer one way or another uh, and be able to give them a different, a better potential uh, loan. Um, so we think about alternative credit data. At TransUnion, we look at dozens and dozens of uh, alternative data sources to ensure that we comply with <coughs> clients and other things. But when we look at it from an analytics perspective, uh, we think about it in the, the start off with what I call the traditional ways in which we think analytically about the value of any information. Uh, this three V's we call them, what's the volume of it? How much information in there is particularly important when we look at uh, credit and alternative data that there's gotta be enough of it to make a difference. Uh, when you have 235 million adult consumers, you want you know, millions and millions of coverage in order to make it, uh, you know, make a difference in, in, in modeling so that you'll see it once in a while on there. Um, we talk about the velocity of the data, which is particularly important. Again, we want to have information on lots of different people, but we also want to have it on a regular, frequent basis so that the information has value and continues to have value over time. Uh, and the last one is uh, a variety of information. Again, the, the, the uh, types of data and the different types of coverage become very important. Uh, when you get into alternative data, in addition, um, we think of it a couple of other things. So the other thing we look for is the veracity of the data, which is we talk a little bit of the quality, the accuracy, the, the truth in the data. So when new, new data comes to us, we want to make sure we understand not only what it is, the lender perspective, but what's it actually telling us about the consumer behavior. There are plenty of things that work well when you throw it into a model, but if you don't understand why it's working, it's really not a good thing to use. The other thing we look at is understanding then the value of 
the data. Again, we can have a lot of the other things in here, but if we can't then translate that information into better decisions that we make, whether it's from a credit perspective or, or a fraud prevention or pro a mitigation, then maybe uh, it doesn't make sense. And then we look at how much, so in many cases, how much am I spending in cost or effort to acquire and use this data? We need to make sure it's a positive return on the work we're putting into this. Um, and so with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about two ways we can use alternative data as lenders to try to extend uh, the credit buy box. So first I'm going to talk about single source alternative credit data, which is, as I would describe, it's you have a traditional credit model. For those of you that are underwriting uh, risk, you may be using a credit score as a cutoff. And then you say, well, what if I can bring in an additional piece of information in there? How would I think about using it? Uh, and we think about it in kind of two ways. One is you can use uh, alternative data as a filter, meaning that you can you can use it as like a flag to say, well, there's certain there's certain consumers I want to exclude if I see these indicators from an alternative uh, credit piece. It may be the presence of, um, as we'll talk about a little later, a payday lending inquiry or a failure to pay some other type of loan. Uh, and again, you're just looking for one indicator on there. There's another which we call it an inclusion piece. You find out that a consumer does in fact have an account of this type in good standing. Great, I might have been uncertain about whether to extend a loan or at what rate to extend a loan. Now I have some information that makes me more positive on it. Um, and then finally, you can use the information to identify maybe consumers who need additional screening. It's not enough for me to say no, not necessarily enough for me to say yes, but it may indicate that maybe I should find out a little bit more. Um, that's just the basic use. The second one, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about this, which is the idea of creating a matrix of your alternative credit data via a score uh, with your traditional credit data score. So be very surgical about the types of consumers that you want to bring into your, uh, in your loan portfolio. You're going to have an example of that toward the end. Um, so, the example that I want to talk about is very close to home. It's our alternative uh, short-term lending data. It's a single source alternative credit data used by many lenders today. Those of you who are familiar with us, it's the, it's the information that comes primarily from our acquisition of Factor Trust 18 months ago. These are loans, uh, we call them short-term lending data. These are lo loans that are made usually either in a very short duration, a single payment or a couple of payments, less than three months, that typically are too short to include on the traditional credit file, but also include some higher cost installment loans, uh, some buy here, pay here, title lending, some rent to own information uh, that's collected by, again, a, a database that's separate from but fully compliant uh, from perspective than our traditional database. And we collect information on consumers' names, address, phone numbers, so we get the basis of the consumers by which we can bring the data together. And we actually see information on inquiries, trade lines, traditional, and very importantly, performance on the loans, not just the uh, taking in the loans, but actually how consumers perform on them over time, which is particularly important uh, as a risk manager trying to make lending decisions. Um, how big is it? Um, so our credit, this particular credit base, database gives access to about 3.7 million additional unbanked and underbanked consumers. Again, there's a big population out there. This gets to a piece of it. And as we'll talk about later, that's a lot of what happens with single source alternative credit data. You have some additional coverage, which gives lenders a great ability to make decisions on it. Again, uh, we get access to almost a million consumers who we otherwise would not see as part of our lending decisions. And then another uh, 3 million consumers for whom uh, we only have a little bit of information and now we'll have some more information to make better credit decisions. So how's an example, like what kind of information can you use to do this? Well, there's a lot of things that this alternative information can solve for. I mean, we just have a couple of them up here. But you can think about this with almost any type of alternative data. How do we 
Uh, how do we think about over time? So uh, it turns out that when you look at these consumers, they, we, they provide bank account information as they're taking out uh, payday loans. You find that consumers who have more bank accounts tend to be a little less stable uh, and then more delinquent over time. Conversely, uh, consumers who don't change bank accounts tend to be stable and perform pretty well. Address stability, you learn a little bit more about consumers with that. Um, you find out more, the more contact information, more cell phones you have, consumers tend to be uh, typically higher risk. Um, you find out that consumers who are delinquent on traditional loans uh, tend to also be delinquent on short-term loans, high correlation there, but as we'll see, there's actually some benefit of consumers who are users of short-term lending products, but are actually um, regular borrowers with positive payments actually perform better than that traditional group. So there's a lot of information uh, that gets to the five needs we talked about with our alternative credit data. And what's really interesting, and so the first thing is you say, well, how does this, how does this add value to it? And it's a good example when we look at consumers who are, who are uh, present in an alternative database, and not present means in the traditional credit file um, for subprime consumers. And what you see is, to no surprise, if you're a consumer that's taking out a short-term loan, a payday loan, you're more likely to be delinquent on, on anything. So again, as a lender, you're using alternative data to, to understand a little bit more about a consumer. In this case, uh, if they're out there taking payday loans, it's maybe not the best credit risk as if they were not. Um, but, and this is the part that's interesting, and so you know and you'd expect, and it corresponds with what uh, you as a credit risk manager would want to know if there's somebody who has a short-term loan on the file, probably a higher risk. However, you find out that consumers who've taken out a short-term loan and then don't have a delinquency on it, or that they've paid it back, yes, they're slightly higher risk than a traditional subprime consumer because they're going to pay the owner, but they're a lot less risk uh, than you otherwise uh, might find. And you're able to, that you could use information like this, either through your filter or a score matrix you create to, uh, you know, offer a potential better rate to a consumer in this space or decide to make a loan where you might not otherwise do so. Um, the other thing that is actually pretty interesting on this is uh, you think for the most part that habitual users of short-term lending products are riskier the more they're using them, but in fact the opposite is the case. So again, you're using alternative data to learn something that consumers who use them but not all the time, but use them, they're, they're, they're the population of consumers who truly believe in the short-term lending product as a tool in their wallet to manage their short-term lending needs. And the folks that do that uh, occasionally throughout the year actually end up being a, a pretty low credit risk relative to the other folks in the population. So if you're a person that, that needs a uh, three to $500 loan or a short period. Um, yes, it may be a higher cost loan, uh, but it, it fits your needs. You're doing your paying off. You're actually a relatively good credit risk. I mean, this is great information for you to use as a risk manager where you see a consumer, again, you don't have a lot of information on them. You're not sure whether or not to make them a loan. You see information on the file uh, in our short, in our alternative credit database that tells you a consumer is there, so they may be riskier, but if you see that they're um, you know, a, a regular user who pays back their loans, this might be a good credit risk. This is the kind of consumer who may, who may be ready to move up into the traditional credit on a regular basis, and we kind of want to make them loans. Um, we, yes? Quick question. Sure. Well, 12 MOV, what's that mean? Uh, I'm sorry, that is... Uh, Months, months on book. So within 12 months, are you uh, okay. so, more than three payments late? So is this, just to make sure, so somebody with nine or 10 payday loans in the last year? On our database, most of them are within the last couple of years. Okay, all right. But that, okay, mm -hmm. interesting. All right, thanks. So again, if you're, uh, again, if you're a very, very frequent user, you're still less risky than if you're using it right. uh, one time. 
But yeah, that's a, that's an interesting curve shape, and I'm trying to see what that correct who who, who that what that use case is like. Anyway, pardon the interruption. Sure. Um, so again, what are the things you can use it for? And again, think about this, and as as you look at the information that Urgent Act collects and has available, also it's very powerful additional information on consumer behavior. You can think about using it in getting a fuller picture of this, this consumer, really understanding all the ways in which they use credit in order to make a credit decision or to tailor the product offering to meet the needs the consumer has today because every consumer has uh, their own uh, way in which they want to engage uh, their credit for their particular financial needs in the moment. We talk about using these to swap consumers in and swap consumers out. Uh, a lot of a lot of us tend to think of alternative credit days as a way to say no to consumers, but it's also a great way to say yes. Uh, and we'll show a little bit on our matrix later. Uh, and to that, it's about universe expansion. This is not only how do I find unbanked consumers, but how do I find pockets of consumers to to market to and offer products to that maybe I haven't been able to in the past. Um, you know, I, I think of an example of the information the utility data. Almost every consumer who uh, has to have a place to live usually has an engagement with some type of utility or multiple types of utility, and that's a great way to establish um, you know, good payment behavior, uh, although there's a bias to making your utility payments anyways, but you can see the size and patterns, and, and, and as, a, as a data scientist, use that to extrapolate uh, what the likelihood of the consumer is to perform on their first you know, credit card product with you. So it's very powerful stuff. Um, I want to talk briefly about uh, multi-source data. Uh, multi-source data is, we can work with one, uh, but it's even better when you can bring different sources of data. You, I, when I talked about what counts as alternative credit data, I listed about 10 different categories. There are lots of sources of information out there and ideally, as a lender, you want to be able to bring these together to make decisions. Um, and clearly, there are great, great reasons to do it. You, you increase a scoreable population, so where I may have you know, 3 or 5% coverage with one, I may, I may have 6 with another, 3 with another, and the way they interact may give me a net gain of 10 or 12% coverage of consumers. Um, I also get, with different types of information, a much more holistic view of consumer credit behavior in order to, to get a picture of how they behave, in order to make good decisions uh, and, make, and offer the right products. But there are a lot of, there are a lot of challenges, and I'll, I'll cover just a little bit because uh, I, I don't think I have a lot of credit risk modelers in here, so I, I wasn't sure how deep to go on this. But, Things that like, really matter when you bring them together. Data structure is super important. Uh, we talk about uh, like all kind, like credit data can be collected in lots of different ways and structured in in in, in different uh, call it frequencies of payment, uh, timings of payments if it's payment information, um, individuals versus households and things like that. Uh, structure is particularly important. Uh, likewise, um, there are some times where, uh, with certain data sources, they're populated regularly, sometimes they're not populated regularly. As a data scientist, because it's there sometimes, but not always, does that mean I can't use it? Not necessarily. It means I have to think carefully about how I use it, and when I use it, how I weight that and interpret it compared to the sources that I get on a regular basis a little bit more of that. Coverage is particularly important. Again, um, when you bring data sources together, you may actually be multiplying coverage on the folks you already have and only on the margin uh, getting, a, getting a few more consumers. So how do you build a score and think about somebody who uh, comes in and is a match on three of your sources in one case, only one source in another case? How do you weight them? How do you weight your models to take care of that so that you can create a score and a solution that applies to everybody? Uh, it's particularly challenging. Um, stability of the data, as I talked about, um, not all um, 
not all sources of credit data tend to be stable over time, meaning that um, depending on how it's collected, the means of the collection may change, uh, formats uh, may change, particularly if data is collected for uh, one purpose but then used for another purpose. Uh, you want to have a resiliency in your model development so that if things come in slightly different uh, from one month to the next, uh, that your model can compensate for that. Uh, we talk about consistency. This idea of batch versus online, which means the, the real-time acquisition of the credit data, as we call online batch, again, we're using large files of the site. Um, that's not always the same. The, the work that you do to normalize and prepare a large file of data to send to get ready for mail may be very different than you do on a, on a daily basis when you're going out to query uh, a source. You may need different sources of data. You may need uh, slightly different data elements, and the way you get them back may be different. And so a score has to compensate for what you do in development on badge versus what you do online. Uh, regulatory compliance is particularly important when we think about how to build scores. Um, just because it's compliant with the law and it creates a differentiation from a risk management perspective doesn't mean it's always the best to use in a model. And like I say, if you don't feel comfortable stepping out, you know, in front of a news camera or in front of, um, you know, uh, uh, Congress saying, this is what's in my model, I believe in it, then you probably shouldn't be using it. Uh, and a little bit of it has to do with the reputational risk. And you may find that there are consumers who, um, you know, find an, an example, you know, you may find that consumers who, uh, you know, buy um, Pampers versus Huggies perform differently. And it may be great in the model, like this may, you make millions of dollars, but did you feel comfortable um, going out into the public and saying, well, we had to deny you because you buy hampers, or you know, <laughs> hampers. You should have bought huggies. Like, that, that's where we talk about this regulatory compliance as well as the reputational risk. It's, it's very important. Uh, so it's particularly challenging. Uh, you know, we at TransUnion have, have you know over ten years of experience thinking about and integrating data. Uh, I talked about this. It's when you are used to working with traditional information. Uh, we talk about traditional credit data is an exceptionally rich structured, consistent uh, set of information upon which you can use great statistical techniques and refine models to the nth degree. Uh, when you bring in alternative credit data, you create an additional dimension around risk management and modeling that you have to think about um, things like coverage and ability to measure risk. Um, because I have information, I have value. But I may also have value in not having information where I know I have coverage. Um, and I also have to think about uh, there are certain solutions you may have that have strong geographic biases. How do you work that in the model and make sure that you use that? Um, all things to consider as we do this. Uh, and, and when you think about that is when you integrate traditional with uh, alternative credit data. Think about it like I got a Lego block piece here. It's like that big Lego block covers pretty much everything you want to do, but how do you layer on and connect the other sources of alternative data so that you can create a score that works well or a, a solution that works well with all consumers? Um, it, it works whether you use something that's an alternative credit data, like we talked about with uh, TransUnion short term learning, or and obligation data like the utility information that Urgent has. You have to think about how to bring it in and coverage and who's available. Then, oh, by the way, if you're working with um, a company like Urgent that's growing all the time, as new information comes in, keep an eye on how it's performing your models because you may suddenly see an increase in maybe a certain area of the country you hadn't expected a data coverage before, and you know, models may have to adjust for that. Um, so we've done that, and a good example of this, and I'll just show that we have a solution that we call Credit Vision Link. Uh, it's a, a solution of versions we've had uh, 
for close to a decade that really um, we've invested in looking at all sorts of information. How do we bring it together in FCRA compliant manner that, you know, what it really allows many of our customers to do is have one score to make decisions uh, that doesn't require thinking about how to bring together all these uh, disparate data sources that we talked about on the page before. Um, it also allows you to do like a streamlined dispute resolution for any of you that have been in, in lending or managing it. Uh, the disclosure and dispute process within the FCRA is um, it's very important to do and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very intensive process to get correct. Uh, and you know, as, as one of the uh, national consumer reporting agencies, we have a lot of experience in uh, disclosure and dispute resolution including our consumer relations expertise. So, talk a little bit about, uh, well, what does it mean? So, um, you look at Credit Vision Link and what does it do in terms of getting you access to more consumers? So today, if you're looking at the traditional credit report, generally speaking, you have about a 94% match of everybody that comes in the front door looking to get a credit report. So 6% of consumers don't come in, you know, they would be considered to TransUnion unscorable. It's probably it's smaller than what you would see from the CFPB and the unbanked piece because within the unbanked, uh, many don't even come through the credit side. Um, if we add one source of data to that, what we get is about a percentage point of additional coverage. But when you, you have a multi-source solution like Credit Vision Link, you can get you know, a total of the three percentage points or three basis points increase. Again, across the population, and as a lender, you know, 3% seems small, but it's exceptionally powerful uh, for you as a lender. One is, uh, if you're, you're the only one using it in town, you have access to 3% of the pop, that adult population, which in my math is probably about 7 million people that maybe your competitors aren't seeing today. It gives you a wake up on there. Um, it also gives you a chance and sort of one stop to address this, how do I, how do I do the information for good? So it allows you to do it one-stop. Um, you know, uh, we talk about how we improve risk outcomes here and the, the value of the information, and this is like statistics, I'm like, this idea of chaos score is like, how good is your risk model? And it ranges from a zero to 100, uh, Vantage score 3.0 is one of the national models, one that you might see if you went in and, and Check your uh, credit score online. Uh, the power of that is we call it 12.7. Like to, if against just a random population, this gives you a lift. You get a, if you use um, the Credit Vision Link score, this is that that blended piece or single piece. You get an additional lift. If you matrix scores, you get an even greater benefit. Um, together, it's increased from 12.7 to 19.2. And I only have a little bit of time, but I want to give you an example of how you might use this as a lender. I try to make it like not uh, too sophisticated, but I feel like I probably did. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to explain it, but I'll also be here tonight and over the breaks if like, you need me to explain it. So I really at the top, I was, you know, we're really going to try to automate this. So if you just ignore the colorful stuff about it, if you were just using a traditional credit score and you ranked it from the 300 to 850 that you think about, you split all the consumers into five buckets, and you said, what percentage of them are going to be three or more payments due in the next two years? Whole, of the whole population, you have 5.7% of them would, would, would you know, go pretty seriously delinquent. In the bottom group, the folks with the lowest scores, it's 21% of those consumers. In the, on the top bucket where you have your, your, your top 800 or 715 higher scores, you are about 16 basis points of loss. So for you as a lender that's trying to think about how to uh, price a loan, um, if you're offering a, again, auto loan, you know, 3.9% auto loan, uh, there's no way you're going to do it to groups one and two, right? Maybe to group three, depends on, on your other cost you need loan done, but four and five probably for sure. Uh, what you're able to do when you bring in an alternative credit score, such as uh, Credit Vision Link, if you took another population and you scored them on the side and said, I'm going to break them into 
to five buckets uh, and run that score against each of the, the, the five buckets here. You see, if, if you've got, a, for example, in popcorn, if you got both a high a traditional credit score and a high alternative score, you're only five basis points of loss in that space. Um, if you already have that it may not make a difference in the type of loan you make. Uh, but what you find is as you move uh, to the left and down, I'm just want to sure I get the audience perspective on that one. Uh, you see that the, the alternative score uh, segments risk in a couple of ways. And probably the best is to look at what's that quintile number two where we had a 5% total loss rate. But this is kind of on the edge for a lot of lenders of whether you want to be in there or not. But what I can quickly see is that, um, you know, I said that 3.9% rate. You know, if I had somebody that was in the in that bucket number two of my traditional score, but they ended up as a high score on my alternative credit, uh, my expectations for them and my loss rate uh, are gonna be about 1.7%. Now, they're looking a lot more like the bucket ahead of them and I can do, can make a, a loan on that side. Even, even better when you look at the lowest scoring folks, uh, if you're in that, that, that bottom group, number one, but you're in the top of the alternative credit score, uh, you know, that's a, a almost 14 percentage point difference in terms of loss. And so now you as a lender have real options to find a, a, a group of consumers who, um, to everybody else, look terrible. But to you, it might look a little better. You have a way to make an offer. Uh, that's the power of alternative data. And this is, you know, we show with the alternative credit score, which are our multi-score piece, but it works if you build a score on one piece of information. In some ways, you can use this from a flagging perspective as well. Um, so alternative is, is, is super powerful. I forgot my time, right? Yeah, you're good. All right. Uh, just an example on here. It really, really does work, and there are people that are out there that use it. Um, you know, we have Subprime Auto Lender that, if you're if you're familiar with with the auto space, particularly those who work with auto dealerships and the capital finance companies, you're providing a service, and what that dealer wants is for you to approve more customers because they're selling cars, and the consumer they can't get financed at a good rate is someone who's not going to buy a car. And if you can help the consumer buy a car through that dealership, everybody wins. Um, and so what we saw is we talked about uh, the biggest part of there. Take a look at the, take a look at the second piece. 32% of the loans that they declined in this population could have been booked at an acceptable rate for them. Again, think about this piece. This is a power of alternative data. Uh, they use some of it, they increase their portfolios size and they're focused on subprime lending so their results are going to be a little bigger than maybe a traditional prime lender but this is these are folks that are getting cars into the hands of consumers we did a uh, just an aside we did a great study a few years ago with one of the manufacturers one of the large auto manufacturers and we, we did a study like this with their captive finance company and we went back and looked at their um their uh, portfolio of the loans that they declined, and then that consumer bought a different car, like a different brand car in there. And if only they'd, they'd been able to approve those loans, they probably would have gotten their loan done. And I think it would have made something like a $5 billion per year difference in that manufacturer's auto sales. Like these things are powerful and they really help. Uh, you know, and by the way, it's great for the consumer because the consumer wanted to buy that car originally, which is why they applied for that loan. And because nobody would say yes to them in a way that they could afford, um, they had to go buy a different car, a car they didn't necessarily want. So it's very powerful stuff. Uh, again, in summary, there are, as we said, all, millions and millions of unbanked and American consumers. Uh, you know, an alternative credit data, as we've shown, provides insights, uh, different, greater insights than uh, traditional credit alone. And, and when, when you combine the two data sources together, you can identify populations to swap, swap in, swap out, uh, to make better lending decisions. Uh, and as you add data sources, you increase coverage, ability to measure risk. As I said, especially with that example in the auto piece, when you use alternative credit data as a lender, it really creates opportunity. I encourage everybody to take a look at it.
Uh, we have a couple minutes for questions? Yeah, we do. So first of all, thank you. And uh, Jason, I thought I'd get the Q&A started. Up, started. Um, I know you run U.S. financial services for TU. Mm -hmm. TU has a big global footprint. I'd be curious about your perspective on mm -hmm. alternative data and, and what it looks like on a, on a global basis, what the opportunities are outside the U.S. for using alternative data. Uh, in some ways, they're, they're, they're very different. In some ways, they're much bigger. And, uh, we operate in, in seven geographies around the world. Uh, five of them are what we would call emerging geographies, our largest being India, but we're also in a uh, large area of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and what you see there is, uh, India's a great example where we uh, are the, own the, the traditional credit bureau there. Uh, we talk about um, coverage of, it's about the same size, 250 to 300 million consumers in India at a risk level, but that's a tiny fraction of the population. And there are lenders out there that are using sorts of alternative data, particularly around uh, smartphone usage, uh, to understand where and how to offer risk. And we, 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 it's, it's, a, it's like an emerging fintech market that was like the US was six or seven years ago. People are talking about finding spaces and finding consumers and using information about maybe how they use their phone, or how they performed on micro loans to decide you know, how to offer them the equivalent of um, uh, charge card uh, you know, uh, financing through the end of the month without the actual card. Uh, and again, using things, uh, the utility information, I think in, in Africa is being used probably more than any other place, although the main utility, if, if we call it that, is, is really the, the cell phone, the minutes they're using on that. Okay. That's great. Time for another question? Yep. Yes. Uh, back on slide 30. 30. Uh, when you were comparing the different KS scores. Yes. Um, I realized I put something really complicated on it. That's okay. I think it's great. Yeah. I would love to know, just for comparison, uh, what is the KS score of FICO 4? Because that's 100% of what I'm encountering. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't uh, okay. I don't have that. Okay. I would love to know how those compare to older ones. Well, I would say, uh, you know, I won't make comparisons, but, you know, Vantage score 3.0 represents sort of the traditional national right. uh, general credit score. Okay. So. Okay. Okay, great. Any, any other questions? We have one more if there's a question from the audience. Yes. Yeah. So uh, you talked about alternative data. Obviously, we are very familiar with utility data, including electric and telecom. Right? What other forms of alternative data that uh, uh, that you're seeing or using. So we talk about the stuff from the, the short-term lending piece. Yeah. I think some of the things that we see that are also powerful, um, uh, like checking and payment information that's not, again, traditionally reported to us, but when consumers um, either uh, bounce checks or open new checking accounts or, or do behaviors like that or consistently make large successful payments that we may not see are exceptionally uh, exceptionally powerful. Um, there are some things you can have other obligations through um, uh, memberships into certain organizations where you're required to, to pay for a period of time. You, um, you know, Those kind of obligations are also good to know about. Uh, particularly the ones that feel very discretionary, because when you're you're able to make your discretionary payments on a regular basis, you're usually in, in a pretty good shape otherwise financially. So uh, we also hear about uh, people mining Facebook and social networks. Uh, what what does all that mean? Uh, so there's a couple things. So one, it's very difficult for that information to comply with the FCRA, but. What I, I also, there's, there's clearly a lot of information there, and I caution lenders in, in two ways when they think about it. First one is, it is very user control in the sense of that uh, you may find a great study that says, you know, if, if you have lots of photos, you know, with red cups that you have buried in your hands, you're a higher risk, you're gonna perform poorly on loans. Well, that's great information, again, there's, regulatory challenges to using it, but you also have the challenge of, generally when the market finds out that that's how you're making it, 
consumers can go and take off all those uh, pictures and things themselves and directly influence the score and the ability of the loan. So you, the best kind of information are ones in which the consumer has indirect control over. So they make decisions. As a result of those decisions, information uh, is reported. Uh, and I think the second thing to worry about as a user of that, many the social media driven access for all kinds of marketing uh, was, a, was a rage uh, five, six, seven years ago. And then uh, Facebook changed the rules. I couldn't access it anymore. So if I'm building a business and a business model on that, it's very like, very difficult to build and to, to worry about you know, being dependent on uh, something like that. Okay, great. Thank you so much once again. Thanks, Jason.